So John 15, we're finally in the 15th chapter. And the title of today's message is Abiding and Not Striving. And this morning we come to one of the most precious passages of scripture, a very personal and intimate and powerful section of John, where John is recording a conversation that none of the other gospels recorded. We've seen that Jesus has said, come to me, and now we're going to see Jesus say, abide in me. And that's what we're diving into today. Now, before we get into verse one, this section of John that we're in, John 13 through 17 is Jesus' farewell message, which began, you remember, in the upper room. And this is all happening on the night before the cross, as Jesus gave the disciples that famous Last Supper. And then the main theme of Jesus' long farewell teaching, as recorded by John, has been discipleship and intimacy with God. This message is not for the crowds. It's for his close disciples how to be a disciple, how to walk in a close relationship with the Lord. Now, it's been a few weeks since we were last in John with the Christmas season, so I want to take a moment to remember the context before we get into 15 verse 1. In chapter 13, Jesus taught. He said to the disciples, love one another the way I love. And, and he showed them how to serve one another by giving the example of even washing each other's feet. He then exhorted the disciples not to allow our hearts to be troubled. And you remember just quickly the promises from John 14 that Jesus gave us. Comfort for the troubled heart. Firstly, that he said, you believe in God, believe also in me. You can trust me. We can simply trust in Jesus. And then he said he's going uh, to the Father's house. And in the Father's house of many mansions, he's going to prepare uh, a place for us. We have this hope of heaven. And of course, Jesus said, I am the way, the way to heaven, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, Jesus also taught that we can know the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How comforting is that? Also that we can ask anything in his name. And when we ask according to his will and his character, he says he'll do it. What a wonderful privilege of prayer we have. He also said, I'll send you another helper, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then he said there's this amazing intimate relationship where we have this connection with God that is so close. He said, as I'm in the Father and you're in me and I'm in you. What a blessing to have this relationship. Jesus said, if we love him and keep his commandments, the Father will show himself to us and show us his love. And then Jesus finished John 14 in verse 27 especially. He said, my peace I leave with you. Not the temporary peace that the world offers, but Jesus' very own supernatural peace. And what amazing gifts Jesus has given us as disciples, as followers of Jesus. And there are many reasons in this world that we could uh, live in fear or with a troubled heart, both in the world and in our own lives. There's reasons for trouble. However, there are greater reasons to experience this supernatural comfort and peace and presence of Jesus with us as we depend on him and as we grow in this intimate, close relationship with him. So now we come to chapter 15 and verse 1. Read along with me. I am the true vine. Or just read along. You don't have to say it out loud, but follow it along with me. <laughs> I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And I think today, for sake of time, that's probably as far as we'll get with the uh, teaching and we'll continue next week, of course. Now, verse 1 is interesting. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. So here we see right away that phrase, I am, and that should trigger a memory for you if you've been studying through John. This is another one of Jesus' I am statements. This is number seven out of the seven great I am statements in the Gospel of John. 
And that, that phrase, firstly, the part that just says, I am, is invoking the name of God from Exodus 3, from the burning bush, when God said, I am that I am, Moses. And now Jesus is saying, I am, this is a claim of deity, that he is God. But then Jesus, with these seven different statements, fills in some color. It's like he's making a picture of what God is actually like so we can see it and understand it. He's the bread of life. He's the good shepherd. And now he's going to talk about being the true vine. And ultimately, Jesus is everything we need. Everything we need in life is found in him. He says, I am what you need. Now, what exactly is a vine? Well, a vine is like the trunk or the central stem of a grape plant. And out of that grape plant stem, out of that vine, comes the branches, and out of the branches comes the fruit. And he's going to say, I'm the trunk, I'm the stem, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and I'm looking for fruit, and the Father is looking for fruit. And the Father's going to come, and he's going to work in your life and cultivate you so that you can bring forth more fruit. But Jesus is really saying simply that he is in the center. He is the center of it all. We could say the obvious, simple meaning of I am the true vine is that Jesus is the source of life. He's the source of salvation. He's the source of fruit. He's the source. He's the center of everything. He's the vine. And so we want to remember that Jesus really is the center. Now, do you remember how John chapter 14 ended? Look at the very last verse of John 14, the very end. It says there, arise. Let us go from here. So at this point in Jesus' farewell teaching, it seems that this is the moment where Jesus and the 11 disciples, remember Judas has left already, this is when they get up out of the upper room and they go out into the evening for a walk. And the other gospels don't record the whole conversation, but they do comment that after the Last Supper and, and this discussion, Judas had left, and then it says they had this conversation. And then Matthew 26, verse 30, it says, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So when you put those two verses together, it seems like Judas is gone. Jesus shares John 14, comfort for the troubled heart. And then they worship, they sing, they praise the Lord together. And they sing a hymn, probably a psalm from the Old Testament. And then... They arise, and as he says there in the end of 14, they go. They go together, and as Matthew says, they go toward the Mount of Olives. We know where they went. Now you say, what's the deal, Mount of Olives? Do you remember what's in the Mount of Olives, a famous garden that is in the Mount of Olives? It's the Garden of Gethsemane. And so Gethsemane is where Jesus will pray this very evening, and he'll surrender fully and be ready to go to the cross, and Judas will arrive, and, and the guards will come, and they will arrest Jesus to be crucified the next morning. So they're on the way now, out of the quiet upper room, toward the prayer and then the cross. And so all that to say, when we start reading 15 verse 1, it's probably on the move. They're not sitting in the room or standing together in the room anymore. They're probably now leaving and going, as, as it says at the end of 14, toward um, through the city of Jerusalem toward the Mount of Olives, which is outside on the east side of the city. Now, why do I say all that? Because it relates to what Jesus is saying, what he would have seen as they walked. Let me explain. When he says here, I am the true vine, we have to understand the Old Testament imagery to really grasp what this means. In the Old Testament... Israel was symbolized as a vine, and the vine was one of the many symbols of the nation of Israel. I'll put a little list on the screen here of some of the verses. Psalm 80, it says, you have brought a vine out of Egypt, and you've cast out the nations and planted it. You've prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root, and it filled the land. So Israel coming into the promised land was like a fresh vine, like a vineyard. God was looking for fruit from Israel. And then Jeremiah 2, God says, Yet I planted you a noble vine, a seed of the highest quality. And then Isaiah, when he comes on the scene, he really challenges the leaders of Israel. And he says, uh, God expected the vine to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. 
And the whole chapter there of Isaiah 5 is not a, a, a happy chapter because God is now challenging them as to why they're not producing fruit as a nation. Now, Israel was meant to be the vine, the source of life, the source of salvation for the world. Israel was God's vine, but they failed. And that's why Jesus also spoke the parable in Matthew 21 called the parable of the vineyard. And in that parable, Jesus said there was a vineyard owner, which is the God the Father, and he left, he planted a vineyard and he left some people in charge. That would be the religious leaders of Israel. And those leaders did not produce fruit. They did not care and tend for the vines. They did not produce anything. In fact, God sent his servants, the prophets, to receive the fruit, but Israel persecuted the prophets. They killed them. They even plotted to kill the son himself uh, of the vineyard owner, which of course is Jesus. And yes, the Jewish religious leaders heard Jesus give that parable. They knew he was talking about them. And then they fulfilled it by saying, let's put him to death. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But they, they thought they could outsmart him, but they absolutely fell into exactly what God said would happen and what Jesus said would happen. They wanted to kill even the son of the vineyard owner. So Israel was meant to be the vine. In fact, you can even see this in coins and in archaeology throughout the history of Israel. I'll put some pictures up. This in, in the archaeological ruins they found near Capernaum where Jesus' home base was for three years in the north. There uh, they found pictures uh, on the buildings of a vine and of a vineyard. This was Israel. And there's a picture there of a Jewish coin. And there you see the, the grapes and the vine leaf. And today you can even buy a modern version of that. Uh, it is there on Amazon for about $50. And I thought about getting one and then I realized, no, I don't need Israel as the vine because Jesus is saying he is the true vine. So I don't need to buy that necklace. Thank you very much. <laughs> but you can see that Israel has been pictured as a vine. And so when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he's taking the national emblem of Israel. For us in Canada, we might say the maple leaf, you know, that's Canada. Jesus is saying, I am the vine. It's not Israel, it's me. God now, he, God still has a plan for Israel, but they're not the true vine. They failed to bring forth the fruit that God intended. Israel failed to bring forth salvation to the world, to be a witness to the world. They became self-focused, they compromised with idols, and they did not produce the fruit. But here's the great news. Jesus never fails. Jesus is the true vine. How encouraging is that? When religion fails us, Jesus never does. When a nation fails us, Jesus never does. When a church or a leader fails, Jesus never does. How wonderful is that? Jesus himself is the true vine. Now, Remember, they've just left the upper room. They're walking now toward the Garden of Gethsemane. Sun's going down. And I want you to picture this, that Jesus, as a master teacher, he loved to use object lessons that were easy to understand for people. And here they are walking through Jerusalem, and we can picture how there was this symbol of the grapevine all around them. Grapes and vines, as people planted them in their yards, were twisting and winding over uh, in all directions as they were walking through the city. Perhaps they would have been uh, some areas of verandas and the grapes hanging down and Jesus and the guys walking through and he's looking at the grapes. He's looking at the, vi the vines. And of course, as they approached Gethsemane and, and the Mount of Olives, they would have passed the temple. And in the big Jewish temple, there was a giant golden symbol of Israel as a vine. And they would have probably seen this as Jesus then turned to the disciples and said, I am the true vine. It's interesting. That's a archaeologist's uh, rendition of what it could have looked like. And as the Jews brought their offerings of fruit and different things to the Lord, they would have climbed the ladder and hung them on this golden vine. And it was a picture of Israel. But Jesus is saying, no, you guys, that's not the vine. I am the true vine. Amazing. Now, what does all this mean? Jesus is simply saying that he is the source of life, that he is the source of fruit, that if we want to have life, if we want to have salvation, if we want to have fruitfulness, we've got to be rooted in Jesus. And it's in him personally. It's in him alone. Jesus is the one 
who connects us to God. No man, no woman, no organization, no church, no denomination, not even Calvary Chapel. We're not the true vine. Jesus himself is. And this is actually really encouraging. Jesus didn't look at the disciples and say, you guys, you're the true vine. Because <laughs> then if he did, it would be on us, wouldn't it? As disciples. It'd be like, oh, I've got to be the one to save the world, to produce, to, to do all this amazing, uh, life-changing work in the world. No, Jesus says, I am the source. You get to be the branches. You just connect to me and I'll bring forth the fruit through you. How freeing is that? How awesome. Jesus doesn't say, you have to go change the world. He says, let me work through you. Let me be the source. Let me be the one. And you know, when you are familiar with your weakness and you're like, man, I, I can't change a person's heart. I can't lead this person I love to Christ. I can't be a light at work and no one's changing. No one's hearts are open. Even parenting, like the hardest job in the world. I can't, I can't change the hearts of my kids. But you know who can? It's Jesus. And if we're abiding in Jesus, he can work through us in ways that we never could. Jesus is the true vine. You're not. You don't have to be. He is. And we get to abide in him. Now look again at verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. So God the Father is like the farmer who is cultivating the branches to produce fruit. Now the word vine dresser, it's an old English term, but it simply means cultivator. Today, if someone owns and manages a vineyard and they're trying to produce wine, there's this term uh, vintner. We could use that one there, or we could just say gardener or farmer. And that's the father. He's the one who comes and he's going to cultivate us. He's going to work in our lives in order to help us produce fruit. Now, you know, farmers, they're much more than people who just like to work outside or work in the field. Farmers are great business people, businessmen and businesswomen. They know how to uh, make production. And what they're looking for in their crops is not just a, a pretty field of crops. They're looking for fruit. They're looking for production. They're looking for more production, for efficiency and longevity in their production. And so too, God, what's he looking for in your life? What does God want from you? It's fruit. It's fruit that lasts. It's fruit that grows. It's fruit that overflows your life. And the Father is at work today in your life to cultivate you so that you can produce more fruit. Now look at verse 2 and 3, how that works. Jesus said, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So here you see a contrast between the branches that are bearing fruit and the branches that are not bearing fruit. And it's true, we will either be fruitful or we will not be bearing fruit. But verse 3 goes on and he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So even verse 2 is modified by verse 3 to say this is all talking about believers. This is talking about genuine believers. If you're a branch who's coming out of the vine, you've been born again, you're saved, and some of those branches are not bearing fruit, and some of them are. And it's a word for believers. Now, when it says there, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away, that can sound a little bit alarming. Like, <laughs> if I'm having a, a really bad season in my life, does God just ditch me? And that's actually not what is being said here by the Lord. The word takes away in the Greek, aero, you might even have a note in your margin, it could also be translated to lift up. He lifts them up. And that word to lift up is the Greek word that's used uh, when Jesus said to the paralytic, take up your mat and walk. When Jesus said to the, or when the 5,000 and the multitudes and he fed them all, and it says the disciples took up the baskets, lifted them up. And so too, if you're a believer and you're having a hard time with fruit, the, the father comes and he lifts you up. Now here's the picture, and this was uh, described by a Christian who's a grape farmer, and I love how he said it. He said that when you have a, a 
a vineyard and you have these grapevines, when a new branch comes out, it will have this tendency to trail down and grow along the ground. And they can't bear fruit on the ground. Those branches are not bearing fruit because they get coated in dust, they get coated in dirt, and when it rains, they get all muddy and mildew sets in. And so those branches are genuine branches, but they become sick and effectively useless on the ground. And so what should a farmer do? Should he just cut them off and throw them away? No, what he does, he says these are too valuable to throw away. He's going to lift them up. He's going to go there and literally clean them. What they would do is walk through, and they still do this today, they walk through the vineyard with a bucket of water, and they look for these branches that are growing on the ground, and they clean them, they wash them in the morning so that the, the sun will come and dry those leaves, but then they also lift them up and tie them onto a trellis or a support beam, wrap them firmly but, but, but gently so that those branches will no longer be full of dirt and mildew, but they will become healthy and bear more fruit or actually start to bear fruit. And that's the picture that Jesus is saying. First of all, if you are a branch in Christ and you're really saved, you've really trusted in him to be your savior, You've put your faith in Jesus Christ, not your works. You're saved. But there are times where there's a struggle, where the dirt and, and the life, we're just down in the dirt. We're, we're covered over again with the things of this world. And sin takes over in our life. It doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. What it means is you're like the branch that's like floundering on the ground. And the Lord, the Father comes to you and he washes you, he cleanses you, he lifts you up and he firmly wraps you so that you'll be supported and that you'll be able to bear fruit. That's what Jesus was saying there in verse two. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So here's uh, a second way that this works. And in fact, let's just pause before we get to the second way. And let's just talk application. If you're a Christian and you're saying, I don't know if there's any fruit. I don't know if I'm, I'm able to overcome sin. I don't know if I'm able to really make a difference in this world. Well, just understand this is what you get from the Father. Not rejection. Not anger. Not you're done. But what you get from the Father is extra attention and special assistance as he washes you and he cleanses you and he lifts you up and he starts to support you in special ways. And God will move situations in your life in order to change your circumstances so that you will be lifted up and not down on the ground anymore because he wants you to bear fruit. Now, when the, when the father does that, I don't think that the vine necessarily likes it. You know, if, if you're a branch coming off the vine and you're the branch that's down there on the ground and you're like, I'm comfortable down here. And the, and the farmer comes and starts washing you and lifting you and attaching you to a trellis. You might be going, hey, that, that's not fun. I don't wanna be moved around. I don't wanna be changed like this. But here's the picture as Hebrews chapter 12 puts it. And I'll put the whole passage up on the screen, but it's really God's way of working in our life through discipline. Notice how it ends with fruit as well, but let's read the whole thing. Verse five, you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as sons. My son, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. And if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons, or we could say daughters too. For what son is there whom a father doesn't chasten? So in other words, if you're a genuine believer, God's going to discipline you because he loves you. Verse eight, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate and you're not a son or daughter. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he, the father for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful in the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So let the Father lift you up. Let him give you his uh, 
grace in the sense of correction if you are not bearing fruit. Let the Father train you and put you back up on the support. How do we do that? We have to cooperate in this. We have to confess our sin. We have to turn from it and let him wash us and cleanse us. Listen to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Hebrews 12 goes on to say, therefore you can strengthen the hands that hang down and the feeble knees and make straight the paths of your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. So if you are like, man, I don't even know if I'm saved. I know I put my trust in Christ at one point, but there's no fruit and I'm not sure what's going on. Go back to that question. Did you really trust in Christ? If so, then you are saved. But if there's no fruit, that doesn't mean God then casts you off. What it means is he comes and gives you the attention you need to raise you back up, but it's going to feel like discipline. <laughs> it's going to feel like correction. And he's going to uh, really call you out and expose your sin in a way where you have to turn from it. You, you're not going to walk in it anymore. And you can make that choice to humble yourself before it gets really open and exposed, or you can uh, continue to try and fight, but God will, he knows what's best for you. And he'll bring that correction. He'll, he'll lift you back up and tie you to the support because he wants you to bear fruit. But here's the second way. Look at verse two, that the father cultivates it says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. <laughs> pruning. Oh, this is a fun one to talk about because pruning is not exactly fun for the plant. And what pruning really means is that there's this act of removing excessive growth or non-fruit growth, extra leaves, extra branches where they're too dense, where they're packed in where they're unable to breathe, where they're rubbing on each other or crossing over, the master gardener comes in with shears to a nice fruitful plant that's got nice fruit, grapes. But he's like, we need to cut some things away here so that there'll be even more fruit. And this is where God does things in our life even when we're on the right track, even when we're growing in Christ and he still takes away certain things at times that don't make any sense to us in the moment. Lord, how can you take that support out of my life? How can you take that comfort out of my life? How can you take that? But the Lord does. Why? Because he wants to bear more fruit. He knows what's best. And he knows that ultimately, if he takes some things away, it'll help you to trust him more. And it will cause you to dig in deeper and to trust him in a deeper way and there will be more fruit. And this is where we could say there's trials in our life that we don't deserve, that, that we haven't actually, it's not a direct consequence of sin, it's just a random trial or it seems random, but actually it's the father pruning something because although it was good, it was, it was fruitful, it was, it was a nice leaf, <laughs> it's blocking the sun of something else. It, it's taking away from the overall fruit bearing energy of the plant. James chapter one puts it like this, my brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So there are times where God disciplines us and there are times where he's just pruning us, but always he wants what's best. He wants more fruit. And whatever you're going through, now's the time to, to humble yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, teach me how to trust in you in these circumstances. Teach me how to walk right with you. And if there's nothing specific that you th should repent of, then he's just pruning. And sometimes he does that. He do in fact, he does that all the time. In my own life, I could share many examples where God comes in and he starts saying, Colin, you're trusting too much in this thing and I'm just gonna take it away. <laughs> and and he, he wants me to trust in him so much more. So, what exactly does the fruit that God is looking for look like? What is fruit? Well, ultimately, he's looking for the fruit of the Spirit. He's looking for Galatians chapter 5, that love and that joy and that peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We could call this the fruit of discipleship, the fruit of a Christ-like life, the fruit of letting Jesus do the work through you to bless others caring for people in need, becoming less self-centered, more of a servant. This is the kind of fruit 
And it does include planting seeds and watering seeds, sharing the gospel and seeing people come to the Lord. That's the kind of fruit the Lord wants to bring through your life. But in order to get there, we have to just stop trying in our own power to produce it, but really abide in Jesus, focus on Jesus, and let him bring forth the fruit. Look at verse 4 and 5, and we'll kind of wrap it up with verse 4 and 5 today. Abide in me, Jesus said, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The word abide is the key word here. And the word there, abide in me, it means to remain in or to continue in or to stay close and connected, simple, to stay as one with the vine, with Jesus, to not separate and run away. Abide in me and I in you. And remember, this is not a question of whether you are going to um, lose your salvation or something like that. This is a question of whether you're going to bear fruit. And you need to abide in Jesus to stay connected in your relationship with him. And Jesus will do his part. When he says, abide in me and I in you, the I in you, he'll do it. The question is, are you going to do your part? Are you going to abide in him? Are you going to remain in him and stay connected to keep on believing, to keep on trusting in every season, in every situation to say, Lord, I'm putting less of me and more of you in the center of my life. And if we stay connected and we stay entwined to Jesus, then what will happen? Fruit will come. Fruit that we don't even realize is necessarily coming. Fruit that we don't even try and bring, but the Lord brings forth fruit through us. We could put it like this. Branches cannot bear fruit by separating from the vine or by striving in their own power, but simply by abiding in the vine. And now put yourself in that statement. You cannot bear fruit by separating from the Lord or striving in your own power, but simply by abiding in him. And so we can picture what abiding looks like. It's really simple. It's just the branch sitting in the vine and staying there. And the fruit, is, it's coming. It's, it'll be there. It's not instant. It takes time. But if we remain abiding in Jesus, just connected, just sitting there in him, close with him, putting him first in our life, focusing on him and not ourselves, not the things of the world, but on Jesus you see, this is not about do more work. This is about stay close to Jesus. And he'll do the work. He'll, he'll shine through you. He'll bring forth fruit through you. You don't have to strive. You just have to abide. And how simple that is. How refreshing that is. That you don't have to produce. You just have to abide. And we need to focus less on trying to bear fruit and more on just staying close to Jesus and letting him transform us. And he will do this amazing work and real, genuine, lasting fruit will come. Now, when a believer is trying in their own power, like you don't really see trees out there with fruit going, come on, trying harder, pushing it out, come on. Like you don't walk past trees and they're like grunting in the background. They're just abiding, they're just chilling, they're just getting the resources. And in time, the fruit is coming because they're relaxed. And I just remember that, how there's a contrast between real fruit that comes from abiding versus man's effort, man's works. My grandpa, he was an amazing wood turner. And he would turn bowls and, and pens out of wood. And one of his favorite things to do is make fruit. And there'd be a bowl of fruit sitting on the table with apples and pears. And, and it was all made of wood. And I'm really glad as a kid, I didn't just grab it and try and eat it because it wouldn't have been healthy. My sister, she used to make fruit out of clay. And my daughters now, they have this little clay set for Christmas and they make it, look, daddy, here's an apple. Nice apple. I'm not going to eat that because it wouldn't be healthy for me. And you, maybe you've seen wax fruit. Definitely don't try eating that one. But that's a picture of man's effort, man's works. That They're nothing to God. They're not healthy. They're not fruitful. They're, they're and you can get busy with a lot of activity and you can produce a lot of your own 
fruit, so to speak. But it's not genuine, it's not real, unless you're abiding in Jesus. Unless the, the fruit is coming from your relationship with the Lord. Your connection to Jesus is the key, not your more effort, more activity. Real lasting fruit comes simply from abiding, not striving. So a vine and a branch, they have this close relationship. They're intertwined. They don't dis, uh, depart from each other. They don't open up and, and leave each other and then come back. They just stay connected. And this is the key for us to be fruitful is to stay connected to the Lord. So how does that look like? What does that mean? Well, look again at verse 4. He says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Man, it's pretty, pretty simple. We can't do anything without the Lord. So how does that work in daily life? Well, what actions are you taking to develop your relationship with Jesus and to stay close to him? And I think we'll explore this more next week because when we get to verse 7, he's going to say, let my words abide in you and ask things in prayer. So there's the word and there's prayer. We'll, we'll talk about those next week. But there's also a lot in here just about staying in that place of trust and, and seeking him and knowing him. And I would just challenge you, do you make time to talk to the Lord about your concerns, to talk to the Lord about your challenges, and to draw near and to listen to his voice, to open his word, to spend time in prayer? And then do you love him? Or is there something else that's caught your attention this week that, that you're loving in this world that you're passionate about, that you're seeking, that, that's your cause or your, your dream or your hope? Or your, what's your number one? It's got to be Jesus. And the more we grow in Christ, the more we get rooted in and the more our branch grows and the fruit comes, it's because we're, we're putting him first. We're loving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I was reading through Isaiah in my devotions, and it's pretty clear. Idols are just nothing. The, the, the things of this world are like so lame compared to the awesomeness of God. And you guys knowing Jesus and pressing into him, let me just say it like this. There's so much more for you to discover in Jesus as you abide in him, as you love him, as you seek him. He's so much more. He's the God who's at work and active and moving according to his promises, according to his grace in your life more than you think. And he wants more fruit in your life than you even want. He wants to bless you. He wants to lift you up, to cleanse you, to attach you to the right supports. He wants to pour in his resources and bring forth amazing fruit through your life. Are you abiding in him? Are you letting the Father cultivate you? And whatever is going on in your life right now, humble yourself before the Father and say, okay, cultivate me. I I'm listening. If you're trying to correct me, I'll repent. If you're trying to prune something, I'll trust you and I'll press in deeper. Lord, you're cultivating my life and I'm listening and I'm open and I'm going to spend time in the word and seek the Lord and let the things of this world grow strangely dim because they're nothing compared to the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. And he gets to work through you. Stop disconnecting. Stay close. Stop drooping and wallowing in the dirt. Repent of sin. Get up and let him lift you up. Let him wash you and cleanse you. He wants to. If you'll just turn to him and open it up fully and repent. And then slow down, stop striving, and abide in Jesus Christ. Submit to the Father as he cultivates and guides you. Next week, we'll get into verse 6. And uh, it's awesome. There's so much more to learn about this abiding relationship. Let's stand together. Maybe as you're listening to this today, you would say you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior. And if that's you, you must be born again. If you don't put your trust in Christ, 
you'll never know God, you'll have no relationship with him, and you can't go to heaven. Because we're lost and we're dead in our sins. You're separated from God by your sin. And you can't do enough good deeds in your own power. It just won't work. Religious deeds cannot remove sin. And that's why Jesus came. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he rose again. And all we need to do is receive his death in our place, receive his resurrection, that he really is the one who died for us and rose again, that he came to forgive our sins. Receive that gift. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. And as you say, Lord, it's not about me. I can't do this. Forgive me of my sin. As you trust in him, you are born again, and it's like a new branch comes out of the vine. That's you. You're born again. You have new life. And you're now growing and you're, you're shooting out of the vine of Jesus Christ. And in time, there'll, there'll be great fruit in your life, not from religious deeds and works, but simply by knowing Jesus and abiding in him. And if you want to pray in a moment to receive Christ as your Savior, I'll lead you in a little prayer and you call out to God with your heart and say, God, forgive me of my sin. I trust in Jesus. And that means you're saved. As you do that with your genuine heart of trust to say, Lord, I'm not trusting in me, I'm trusting in you to save me. And you guys who are believers, and that's most of us in the room, you were made to bear fruit. Your purpose is to bring forth great fruit to the Lord, but not in your own power. You're not the manufacturer. He's the vine. Stay connected. And if there's some way that you've been wallowing in the dirt, let the Lord lift you up and cleanse you. If there's some way that you have been disconnected, let the Lord really root you back in and connect you deep so that you can love Jesus first and walk with him and let him do the transforming work and let the Father cultivate you through the circumstances of life. Whether he's correcting you or whether he's pruning you, he wants more fruit. So Father, today we thank you for the clarity of your word. We thank you for your love for us that you want great fruit in our life. And so we ask, Lord, for your help. And as believers, we just pray, Lord, help us to abide in you. Help us to stop doing this in our own power, in our own flesh. But Lord, really to put you first, to spend time with you, to trust you. And Lord, to open up even the deepest parts of our life to you so that you can correct and heal and restore and re rewire us so that we can be men and women of God who are like a branch bearing great fruit. And Lord, if you're cultivating us in some way, correcting us or pruning us, we're open to that. And we ask you to show us your favor, your grace, and your love, even in these times that may feel difficult and hard. And Lord, we know that you have a greater fruit in mind. And so we trust you today. Lord, we love you. There's more to discover in you, and we want that. And Lord, we pray today for anyone here who's not yet saved. And if that's you, you can call out to the Lord right now and say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. God, forgive me. I put my trust in Jesus to save me. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for rising again. And Lord, please forgive me of all my sin. Come and live in my life and be my Savior and my Lord and help me to have new life in you now and abide in you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen.